we're going to uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so our next Nanoet Tech was scheduled for April 10th. Um, that, that has been canceled. Um, so put that on your, or take it off your calendar if, if the April 10th one was on your calendar. Um, so the last Nanoet Tech seminar for this semester will be April 24th. And the speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Dragomir Davidovich from uh, the School of Physics. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have today's speaker with us, uh, Professor Richard Bark from the School of Public Policy. Um, if you've been coming to these for a long time, you know that traditionally we have you know fairly technical talks, but I like to throw in, I wouldn't say non-technical because I think there's probably going to be something technical here, but, um, but certainly something a little bit different, or as Monty Python used to say, you know, something completely different. Um, but uh, so, so Richard uh, got his bachelor's degree in physics here at Georgia Tech before going off to um, get a master's and PhD in political science at the University of Rochester. Uh, he then spent some time as a faculty member at the University of Houston before coming to Georgia Tech in 1987. So if you do the maths, that's 31 years ago, uh, where he's currently a, a professor of public policy. Um, and spent some time, uh, about uh, seven years, as an associate dean of the Ivan Allen College. Um, and as you'll hear, his research interests are really exploring the intersection between uh, politics and science, which, um, unless you're a hermit, is a pretty uh, important topic uh, going on in the world today. So, Richard, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. I'll begin with a reminiscence since I'm looking out the building at the, at the out the window at the Howie building. Um, let me see. People always <coughs> the question I always get is how in the world did you go from physics to political science? <coughs> well, I was taking classes in that building and I was working in that building. Uh, I was working in GTRI in a lab doing earthquake research, and I was really interested in geophysics. And I became interested in questions such as who is paying for this research? And I remember asking the professor I was working for rather persistently, well, why did they pick you? How do they know that you're qualified to do this? And how do they know if you're doing a good job? And he tolerated those questions. And then I became curious about the issue of how the knowledge that was being developed in the lab was going to be used by policymakers. So a number of other accidents led me to go off and study um, the policymaking process to try to answer those questions. And it's still pretty much what motivates my research. I'll say a bit more about that as we go along, but I need to uh, start out with a disclaimer. I am not a nanoscientist, I'm not a nanotechnologist, I'm not even really a physicist anymore. I know just enough to make me think that I can understand a lot of what you guys talk about, and just to sort of stand in amazement at some of the things that are going on these days. So, um, let me see. So we start out with a problem. Uh, the problem is, uh, as you all know, can you, see, can you guys in the back see this okay? Way back there? Okay. Uh, we start out with the problem. Part of the problem is the enormous benefits that we're already seeing from work. I'm just going to use the word nanotechnology as a, in a sort of a generic blanket term. Um, the, the benefits that we're already seeing and that are forecast to continue, we're not quite sure what the shape of that line or the curve is, but it's still going to be substantial. At the same time, as EPA and NNI, uh, National Nanotechnology Initiative, as they've pointed out, there are still a lot about the risks associated with this technology that we don't understand. And so one of the questions that comes to government policymakers is, well, what do we do about this? On the one hand, we want to promote the technology. It's an enormous boon to our economy, to uh, consumer satisfaction, maybe to the military, to healthcare, whatever you guys are working on. Uh, but at the same time, we need to balance it against the possibility of risks. Uh, the benefits, we can establish, we can attach some numbers to those and with dollar signs in front. The risks are a lot more uncertain. And uh, as we'll see there, of course, they're more long term. So what is the government's responsibility? What is the government's capability of dealing with uh, these issues? And uh, to the degree that this is that, uh, the technology is going to be somewhat shaped by regulations, how are they designed and adopted? Uh, one of the issues, of course, for emerging technologies, not just nanotechnology, but others that have come along, uh, even starting in the 1830s with uh, metallurgy and boilers on steamboats on the Mississippi River that were bursting and nobody could understand quite why the people were, hundreds of people were being killed with steamboat accidents and bursting boilers. Well, we didn't know much about metallurgy and the effect of cooling and heating metal. 
in a, on a daily cycle. Um, emerging technologies have come along since, well, I guess since we moved into, into villages. And um, the, they change. Uh, technology changes far faster than public policies can. And I'll show you an example of how slow policies can move in a, in a few minutes. Uh, policies uh, in a democracy depend in large part on public perceptions, and those perceptions depend on education and on events. So what the public perceives, some of it they learn in school. They're probably not learning nearly enough about, as, as much about nanotechnology as you or I would, would like for them to learn. Um, and then when they pay attention, it's usually because of some event, something that has made it into the news and it wakes them up and they say, oh, what's this nanotechnology thing? We know that people are risk averse and we know that visual images matter. Uh, there's been a lot of work done trying to understand pr risk perception. By the way, not just among the public, but even among experts and scientists, uh, trying to understand how people perceive and, and process information about risks. And we know that visual images are lasting and they make a big impact in contrast to text. Uh, so uh, let's look at a couple of uh, previous cases. Here is nuclear energy. So emerging technology, 40s and 50s, uh, then in, the, in uh, 1979, this movie came out. If you can't read the, oh yeah, the little bit at the top at, above the, the uh, faces, it says, today only a handful of people know what it means. Soon you will know the China syndrome. Who knows what the China syndrome referred to? What was it? Meltdown. Meltdown, right. So a core accident, a cooling accident, the nuclear fuel would melt through the containment vessel, down through the floor of the reactor, it would just keep going and would come out in China. Now, of course, everybody that lives in Atlanta knows that the opposite side of the Earth from Atlanta, being at 35 degrees north latitude, cannot be another country in the northern hemisphere. They should have called it the Perth, Australia syndrome, because that's about the closest place. <laughs> if you go straight down, you come out in the Indian Ocean near Perth. That wouldn't have been as good a title. All right, so the movie came out, and basically Jack Lemmon played the role of, a, of an engineer working at a nuclear facility, and he starts to suspect that something may be wrong. And so he checks into it and he finds out that maybe some inspection records were fabricated and the corporate manager is, of course, being evil people, tell him to ignore all of that because they don't want to shut down and try to rebuild the place. And he links up with Jane Fonda, who's an intrepid local television reporter, and her soon-to-be unfortunate cameraman. And uh, he tries to alert the public to the possibility that this nuclear power plant might have had a design problem. And of course, he, in, at the end of the movie, he resolves this the way all good engineers resolve their conscience problems, by exercising his Second Amendment rights. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a gripping movie, a really good story, good actors. And as you see, the release date was March 16th, 1979. March 16th, 12 days later, this happened. Three Mile Island, right? Uh, and the coupling of a big, uh, fairly successful movie with a big, not very successful accident uh, shaped the public perception of the nuclear energy and nuclear technology for a very long time, probably still including today. People that weren't born in 1979 <laughs> are probably still impacted by this, uh, by this perception. Uh, here's another example, Genet genetically modified organisms. Great potential, also maybe some risks. Well, uh, we began this era in 1975 with a conference at a, at a center in, on the coast of California called the Solomar. And uh, about 180, sorry, 140 biologists, et cetera, got together and said, in effect, this technology that we're developing, the science and technology that we're developing, um, we know that it's going to uh, carry along with it certain risks, and the government is going to do something about it if we don't do it ourselves. So they had a conference, and they put together a set of guidelines to, so that the uh, recombinant DNA research community could become a self-governing community, establish reasonable guidelines, and then preempt government regulations. Uh, it was a, an amazing group. Um, the furry guy on the top right, on the right, is um, David Baltimore, who went on, uh, won a Nobel Prize, I think, the same year. And, the next picture down on the far right, that's Paul Berg, and also a Nobel Prize winner. So the, the heavy hitters in the field came, came together and said, we're going to regulate and try to control this science and technology ourselves. Well, of course, that couldn't last because pretty soon it was a lot more than 140 people involved and a lot more than just the United States involved and so forth. And so, of course, the, the uh, next big step in understanding uh, genetically modified organisms was, um, was Mr. Rex here. Uh, <laughs> 
If you remember the movie Jurassic Park, there was actually a very good little animated film at one point in the movie explaining the technology. And it, that wasn't bad at all, but it ended up with this monster eating, almost eating some ch cute children and, happily enough, eating a lawyer. Any lawyers in the room? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so one more. Uh, Self-driving car is a current technology. You know, there's a bunch of Google cars, and here's a woman, ironically enough, reading a paper book or magazine while her car is driving itself. You'd think that she'd be looking at a Kindle or an iP uh, iPad or something, but she's using paper. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we're hearing the stories about the promise of this technology, and then March 19th, a little more than a week ago, self-driving Uber car kills pedestrian in Arizona where robots roam. <laughs> Roaming robots in Arizona. So um, we have to assume that the, the way the public is exposed to technologies and uh, their costs and benefits are going to be not necessarily what scientists and engineers uh, would say. So now we come to nanotechnology. How many of you have read Michael Crichton's book? Okay, it's basically Jurassic Park with little tiny dinosaurs, right? It's the same story. And uh, it's kind of amazing that a movie hasn't really been made um, based on it because it was written pretty much like a screenplay. Um, it was popular for a while. Uh, so where do we stand now with public perception? Uh, we've got creepy little nanobots about to crawl into somebody's eyeball. Uh, at the top right, there was a movie a couple of years ago where Johnny Depp was a computer scientist that uploaded his personality, his consciousness into a supercomputer and then used nanotechnology to um, hopefully do good things, but it turned out maybe not such good things. And the animation is uh, uh, from a, a website for an anti-nanotechnology interest group that is showing military planes spraying nanobots all over the world. Um, that's what that black stuff is, not gray goo, black goo. So um, yeah, it's, and it's kind of hard to find a visual image um, that portrays nanotechnology in a positive way. So this is part of the challenge for policymakers, is how do people perceive the benefits and the risks? All right, so the basic problem, as I see it, is that, uh, first of all, there's a problem of magnitudes. Uh, the, what are the magnitudes of the benefits and the magnitudes of the potential risks? And there are a variety, you, most, I imagine all of you know these better than I do, such as direct exposure to workers, lab workers, consumers, and so forth, environmental effects, malfunctions of nanomachines and so, so forth, uh, possibility of it uh, uh, being used as offensive military weapons, and then malevolence, you know, things like terrorist weapons based on nanotechnology, there are a lot of scenarios. Uh, another problem is unfamiliarity. Nobody can see a nanotechnology. And uh, of course, the, the rules say that you're not allowed to call it um, uh, nanotechnology unless there's behavior different at the nanoscale than there is at the macro scale. So almost by definition, it's something that we can't perceive and relate to personally. It's almost, you know, it's like trying to understand um, how electrons spin. Velocity, the speed and direction of change. Uh, we think we know it, but it always it varies and surprises us. V variability, nanotechnology, to use the, the rubric, is not a single thing, but it's often talked about it, uh, as if it is. And then the location of the problem, whatever the problem is, it ranges from the local and state level all the way up to multinational and, and global scales. So um, the challenge then is, first, as I said, is how do we balance the benefits and the risks? Um, some parts of the challenge, uh, differing time scales. The benefits are likely to accrue more qu quickly. Some of the risks that people talk about are longer term. Um, as a lot of you know, uh, people have drawn analogies between inhalation of carbon nanotubes and asbestos fibers, even though they're very different scales. Um, and asbestos manifests itself in 10, 20, even 40 years after exposure. So uh, the, the time scale for the risks is very different than the time scale for the ex some of the expected benefits. And those time scales will be different for different actors in the process. The spatial scales, uh, the possibility of local use of this technology, but it ended up uh, eventually having a global impact. So there again, the benefits could be localized, the risks could be global, according to some scenarios. Incommensurability, simply, um, yeah, you can put dollar signs in front of the, a lot of the benefits. You can't put dollar signs in front of a lot of the, the risks. So how do you compare these? That's a problem for a lot of areas of policy, not just this one. And the distribution question, who gains, who pays? So it may be that a few companies, or as we all know, you guys are all going to get filthy rich 
at least that's what the world believes, is that scientists and engineers get really rich from their research. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, other people will pay whatever costs there are to come from the risks. Then there's the question of authority. Who's going to decide? Who makes the decisions about how, whether to and how to regulate this technology? Should it be autonomous scientists and engineers like in a Silomar with recombinant DNA? I think it's, we're way past that. Uh, should it be the marketplace? Should it be law, uh, basically relying on liability and uh, uh, tort uh, problems or intellectual property law to govern the de development of the technology? And what would be the role of government or governments at the state, local, uh, national, or international level? So as we try to deal with this messy problem, I'll just point out that my focus is, uh, the work I do focuses on national regulatory policy, and I'm doing research now looking specifically at timescales. Um, doing a project with one of our former students, uh, recently a uh, gradu recent graduate from Harvard Law School, and we're doing a project looking at how, in the regulatory realm, how uh, both the cognitive aspects of subjective time uh, uh, perception and the timescales of organizations like regulatory agencies, how they come together to try, try to shape our policies. In a nutshell, people don't think of time, but we don't perceive time as clicks on a t clock or pages on a calendar. We have very subjective, sort of a logarithmic compression of time into the present. Um, and yet we don't take those things into account when we talk about issues such as this. The future is long and diffuse. The present is very uh, salient and and compressed, and that's pretty much what we pay folk attention to. Cognitive scientists have been doing some fascinating work on this. It looks like our brains were not evolved to think about the future, <laughs> right? For most of human history, it didn't matter what was gonna happen 20 years from now. You were concerned about the next two weeks at most, um, or maybe the next year. Um, and it, our brains don't function very well when we try to think about long terms. In any case, uh, so uh, why would we regulate risk? First of all, there are information asymmetries. Um, some people know a lot, some people don't know anything. Uh, there's a lack of shared information about the cost of benefits, it cost and benefits of nanotechnology. There was a uh, consumer in a products inventory just a couple of years ago and found that 49% of those products did not disclose the composition of the nanomaterial used. If they did disclose it, it's not clear how useful that would have been to consumers. I don't know about you, but I look at the side of the box when I'm eating my breakfast, and I'm sure not. I don't. I'm not sure what niacin is. Is that good or bad? And how much do I need? So just giving people information isn't necessarily the the key. This is something that Adam Smith was wrestling with in the uh, more than 200 years ago, which was how do we get proper information to people so they can make wise decisions. Uh, you could either do it with the government providing the information or the government requiring manufacturers um, to provide the information. And this is going to be the case that we're going to come back to in just a couple of minutes. There's also the problem of what are called negative externalities. The marketplace is supposed to work with buyers and sellers making voluntary exchanges, well informed about what's being bought and sold and so forth. Uh, but in some cases, buyers and sellers or producers and, and users um, benefit by, ex uh, by exporting some of the costs of production to third parties. A classic example is pollution. Right? You can keep the cost of steel production down if you dump all of your pollution in the river then somebody else gets to pay for it. It's not the producer or the buyer of the steel, it's somebody downstream. So what the government typically does is it tries to internalize, re-internalize those costs using fines and penalties, which is a lot more difficult than it sounds, trying to figure out what are the correct levels of those and how much they should change. Or you can limit the production of bad things, bads. Uh, you can use command and control regulations where, the, for example, EPA simply tells a company, this is what you must do or this is what you cannot do and there's no flexibility there. Or you can use performance standards where you tell a company you're allowed, in effect, you're allowed to do this much bad stuff, but you've got to bring down your level of bads to this level. How you achieve that level of bads is up to you. You can do it the most efficiently uh, uh, way possible, but we're not going to tell you exactly how to do it. So there are a variety of tools, and I'm barely scratching the surface in terms of the regulatory tools that are available. But these, these are some of the reasons why, um, these are some of the things that shape regulatory policy. As we get into more detail on that, you'll see this. Um, there's another set of design principles um, for policy making. Um, doesn't fit well into the market or economic model, but it's certainly something that drives a lot of 
uh, the motivations for regulations, which is this notion of equal treatment and, and basic rights. Yeah, uh, those are still operating principles for the government. Uh, the notion that people are entitled to certain uh, e uh, equal protections and certain fundamental protections, life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness, and so forth. Uh, another key design principle is that there should be no unchecked power in society. This, this is a principle that goes back to the early 1700s in Scotland. Um, the notion that um, it doesn't matter whether it's in the public sector, private sector, scientific sector, engineering sector, or medical sector, it doesn't matter, that it is ultimately harmful. No, let me say it differently. Ultimately, it is very risky to have some power in society which is not checked by another power. Okay? And um, I'll just leave the proof to the reader on this one. Government pursues these objections through laws. Uh, Congress passes laws. It delegates a lot of decisions to agencies. And those agencies develop uh, experience, expertise. They divide the labor and develop uh, really good skills, we hope, in the uh, finer details of what these controls should be on risks to society. These decisions are shaped by standard administrative procedures. Um, basically a law that was passed in 1946 called the Administrative Procedure Act, which is pretty much still in effect, it's largely still in effect, that basically tells agencies here is the right way and the wrong way to make regulations. I'm setting the uh, stage for a case that we're going to look at in a minute. Those decisions that agencies make must be reasonable, fair, transparent, and accessible. Um, those words pretty much speak for themselves except the first one. Reasonable in this context doesn't mean, yeah, it's reasonable. Or, yeah, yeah, that fits with common sense. Reasonable in this context means based on explicit reasoning. You, uh, you have to be able to provide an explicit, defensible reason why you're making the decision that you're, you're making. Okay? So you can't just toss things out and say, well, we all know that it's, this is bad or we all know this is good. You have to be able to provide um, justifiable reasons. One of the things that really grates on, I, I teach a course on regulatory policy, and I get uh, a lot of students from science and engineering to come over and take it, bless their hearts. And one of the things that drives them crazy is that uh, this is a inherently designed to be an adversarial process. The notion of why can't they just figure out what the truth is and make decisions based on the best available evidence and just, just get it done. Um, the problem is that our system is set up to be adversarial so that there are, basically it's almost a version of one of Newton's laws for every interest there's an equal and opposite <laughs> anti or opposing interest. Um, and it's one of the ways that we check powers to make sure that whatever is being suggested there's somebody out there to, to put it to the test, to test the assertions, to test the data, to bring in alternative evidence, alternative arguments, give voice to opposing interests and so forth. So when people say, you know, look at the process and say, yeah, but they're all just always fighting with each other. The process was designed for them to fight with each other, up, up to a point. I mean, it can be taken way too far sometimes, as I think we're seeing sometimes these days. Um, but it's a, basically, it's a fairly sensible way to design a system that involves allocation of power, is to make sure that everybody has a chance to, to weigh in and try to influence decisions. Again, this is setting the stage for a specific example I'm going to look at in a minute. All right, so I guess that minute has arrived. So regulating nanotechnology risks, how do we do it? Uh, we start out with law. Um, the most, um, the, the fundamental source of authority for this or any other type of regulatory action is Congress, our elected officials. And so they pass laws and they say, in effect, we're going to have clean water. EPA, go make clean water. <laughs> or we're going to have clean air or how many of you know what FIFRA is? <laughs> it's, of course, it's the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a law just for that. Uh, CERCLA is also better known as Superfund, dealing with hazardous waste sites, and RICRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, is also dealing with hazardous waste. Uh, most of these laws go back to the 1970s when we were just trying to figure out how to control what looked like runaway environmental pollution. You know, you've seen pictures of what Los Angeles or Pittsburgh looked like in the 1940s, or what they didn't look like because you couldn't see them for all the smog. Uh, burning rivers, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio on fire a couple of times. 
uh, uh, Love Canal, a waste site outside of Buffalo that it turned out people had been sold houses on top of a hazardous waste dump. So there were a number of events, very visible visual events that led to the passage of a number of these laws. The bottom one here I'm singling out because we're going to come back to this. It's called Tosca, uh, and it doesn't refer to Italian opera. It's the Toxic Substances and Control Act. Um, and that's what uh, an awful lot of the nanotechnology regulation, at least under EPA, now comes under. The Food and Drug Administration also has a, a role in this, it but it tends to regulate products, not technologies or categories of technologies. It generally looks at things on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, deals much more with drugs and with things like dietary supplements or, or food. A lot of food regulation is done by the Department of Agriculture, not by the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, you can imagine the political reasons why that would occur. And then OSHA and the National Institute for Occupational Safety Health, dealing with workplace safety and health issues, um, some of which I'm sure apply to things that go on in this building. So there are a number of, of um, and I could have listed the, the laws that allow FDA or require FDA and OSHA to do what they do as well. But it's a large number of agencies, as we'll see, and a large number of laws that, that set it up. Um, and here's an example. Don't have to read the whole thing. Uh, this is an excerpt from the 1976 Toxic Substances Control Act, and there are some words here that are highlighted. Uh, an act of Congress, a law generally starts out with findings and a purpose. Here's what we're trying to do. So it starts out by saying Congress finds that human beings in the environment are being exposed each year to a large number of chemical substances and mixtures. Among these are some which may present an unreasonable risk of injury to, the, to health or the environment. Notice that word unreasonable, unreasonable risk. Not all risks are bad, just unreasonable risks are bad. Who's going to decide what's an unreasonable risk? Right, we're coming back to that. Uh, it is the policy of the United States that adequate information should be developed. Um, it, the development of that information should be the, uh, let me see, should be, can't really see it here, the responsibility of those who manufacture so not only do we need information, but those who produce this stuff uh, have the responsibility of uh, providing this information. Um, adequate authority to regulate chemical substances and mixtures, which present this unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment. And um, third, that any authority over all of this, any regulations should be done so as not to impede unduly or create unnecessary economic barriers to technological innovation, as long as we make sure that we avoid unreasonable risks of injury or to, to health or the environment. Now notice the number of words in here that are kind of uh, challenging. So we'll just take, um, take clause three here. Uh, such a manner as to uh, impede unduly or create unnecessary barriers to innovation. Um, uh, avoiding an unreasonable risk. So there are a lot of flexible words in here. Uh, why does Congress do that? Why do they pass laws with this kind of sort of squishy language? Well, in part, it's because Congress knows that it doesn't know enough to be specific. In many cases, Congress knows that the scientists and engineers don't know enough yet to be specific. And so they put, they put this language in laws basically telling, in this case, the EPA, uh, as you do your work trying to implement this law, you're going to have to figure out what unduly impede or unnecessary, or bar unnecessary barriers means in practice. Now, they're not just handing all of that authority to the agency and saying, you go figure it out. Well, they kind of are. But they're also doing it with a club hidden behind their back, which is that from time to time, we're going to invite the EPA administrator up to Capitol Hill and we will have heard from constituents, including people doing nano, 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 nan, sorry, nano manufacturing or other sorts of things. We're gonna be hearing about how the EPA is being unreasonable, unfair, um, uh, unduly restrictive, um, and impeding technological innovation. So you're gonna to have to come up occasionally and give us the reasons, there's that word, you're gonna to have to give us the reasons why you're doing what you're doing. You're gonna to have to defend what you're doing. So they delegate a lot of the authority to the agency, but they do it in such a way that they, Congress would ultimately have the authority. I mentioned RICRA in the previous slide, the uh, 1976 Resource Conservation Recovery Act. Congress told EPA, go deal with hazardous waste. It turns out there's a lot of it out there, and we need for you to clean it up. So EPA started doing that. 
they started doing an inventory of hazardous waste sites around the country. Within two years, they had found out that the magnitude of the hazardous waste dump, dumping problem, landfills and so forth, was at least 10 times as large as Congress had thought it was just two years later, earlier when Congress passed the law. Until we started implementing the law, we didn't know how bad the problem actually was. And then EPA said, oh my gosh, we've got this huge problem. How do we prioritize? Congress has given us X number of dollars to clean stuff up. It turns out there's 10 times as much stuff out there as we thought. We don't have nearly enough money to clean it all up. So we need to prioritize. What do we clean up first? Do we clean up places where there is a small community facing an immediate risk? What about a large community where the risk is five or 10 or 20 years away? How do we prioritize? Congress didn't tell us how to do that. So they basically they froze. They waited until somebody took them to court and said, why aren't you cleaning up my neighborhood? And this forced Congress to go back and act again. And eight years after they passed this first law, Congress passed another law that was amazingly specific in what it stipulated in terms of you know, plastic liners and clay liners underneath hazardous waste landfills and incineration techniques. And a huge amount had been learned in only eight years. So sometimes that happens. All right, so here's another example. Uh, so we passed TSCA, that previous law, that was 1976. This is an act of Congress, um, June 19, uh, 2015. Uh, this is the Senate version. The, the bill finally passed the full uh, Congress about a year later. This is a Senate version of a bill to amend the Toxic Substances Control Act, the one we were just looking at, to reauthorize and modernize that act and for other purposes. This is the Senate version. It's got 60 co-sponsors. This is only a couple of years ago, you know, the era of rampant partisanship and so forth. So you've got 60 Republicans and Democrats together sponsoring this bill in the Senate. So sometimes the stuff that doesn't make the news, sometimes Congress actually does its job pretty well. It's just not very exciting and so they don't cover it on the news. Uh, but what they did was they said, look, it's been a long time since we passed Tosca. There are a lot of new products out there, including the stuff you guys work with. Um, and it's not clear that the current, that the old law applies as well today as it used to. And we, the old law had some flaws in it as well. So this was one of the major, there have been a few other revisions of Tosca in the meantime, but this is the most recent one. So this is Congress now saying, we're gonna go back and try to address some of these, these problems. Uh, this is part of that law. Again, a lot of details here, but basically what's relevant for, for the uh, nano folks is um, a section that says a, a person, meaning person or a company, that, who manufactures or processes or proposes to manufacture or process a chemical substance, et cetera, shall provide records and reporting with respect to the following, the name, chemical identity, and molecular structure of each chemical substance, uh, the total amount of each substance and mixture uh, that's going to be produced, reasonable estimates of the amount that will be manufactured or processed, and reasonable esti estimates for each of the categories of use or proposed categories of use. A description of the byproducts resulting from the manufacturing, et cetera. All existing information regarding environmental health effects of such substance or mixture, the number of individuals exposed and reasonable estimates of the number who will be exposed, um, and the manner or method of the disposal of this stuff um, as part of the production process. So, so there's an exception in, in paragraph A there that says other than a small manufacturer or processor. So did right. they define what small is? They did. In fact, I'm, that's, that's a great question. I'm going to come back to that. So, um, yeah, this, this is the, uh, this is, Sorry, uh, actually, yeah, this is, this is the law. Congress did not define that. They left it to EPA to define that, yeah. And we'll see that in just a minute. Um, because Congress really didn't know enough, especially looking at stuff, um, uh, some of the, part of this explicitly included nanoscale materials and Congress basically, if you go back and look at the record, they said, we don't know how much of this stuff is around. We don't know whether it's being produced by little tiny companies, big companies, EPA, you're gonna have to figure this out. Okay, so um, I'll just skip down here to section D, health and safety studies. Um, EPA shall require any person who manufactures, processes, or distributes, et cetera, any of this stuff to uh, provide uh, the lists of health and safety studies that they know about. Um, and also down here at section E, anybody who obtains information which reasonably, su reasonably supports the conclusion that such substance or mixture presents a, presents a substantial risk shall immediately inform EPA. 
okay, reasonably supports the conclusion that it presents a substantial risk. All right, so basically this is a way of requiring people that manufacture chemicals, including nanoscale stuff, to uh, report to EPA what it is they're doing, how much of it they're doing, uh, what they know about the uh, possible health and environmental risks, and to continue to report as they learn more about what they're doing. So this is, this is what the law told EPA to do. Okay. They, they pass the law and nothing happens until EPA decides to, it, it, uh, that they need to act on what Congress told them to do. So now Congress, EPA has to act. Here are the questions um, that EPA has to deal with. First of all, what does the language actually mean? What, is, what does the law require? So I've already pointed to some of these somewhat ambiguous words. And as I said, sometimes Congress puts these words in because they don't want to decide because if Congress is too specific, the stakeholders that are going to lose under their definitions are going to raise all kinds of commotion and, if they're in, and so forth. So a lot of times they just kick the can down the road to the agency. But most of the time it makes sense for Congress not to be that specific. Uh, how quickly must action be taken? Uh, what do we have to do in the first year? Is Congress saying we have to issue all of these uh, guidelines and start collecting this information in the next month, the next six months, the next three years? Most of the time, Congress, a lot of times Congress doesn't say that. Uh, who is being affected? So who should we consult? EPA doesn't exist in a vacuum. They, 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 they're in contact with industry, with environmental groups and so forth, but who should they involve in the discussion about how to actually implement what Congress told them to do? What are the costs? What are the benefits? Um, uh, I'm sure you recognize how difficult that is. Uh, my school, public policy, we teach an entire semester course on cost-benefit analysis, and next year we'll offer a second course called Advanced Cost-Benefit Analysis. That's how difficult it is, and we want people to know how to do it well. Uh, how will actions be portrayed in the media? Uh, the agencies generally don't admit that this is a major concern of theirs, but of course it has to be. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a great deal of concern about radon gas in people's houses, uh, uh, basically a uh, daughter from uh, trace amounts of, of um, radium in things like granite. If, if, you've got, if you've got concrete blocks in your basement, you've got radon in your basement. And it's colorless, odorless, tasteless, and all of that. But over the long term, it's a substantial health risk. And EPA was trying to regulate it because the epidemiological study showed that this was actually a significant health risk, even though most people don't know it. So they tried regulating it, and all kinds of fury broke loose because people said, you're going to make me do what? To clean up the air in my basement? There's no problem with the air in my basement. I don't smell anything. What about the, my water tastes funny? So why isn't EPA worried about my water? And EPA said, well, we've tested your water, and it may taste a little bit funny, but it's perfectly safe. It's your basement that's dangerous. And it went all the way up to Congress, and Congress basically said to EPA, you need to respond to the public's concerns. It's not about the, the raw science, it's about what the public perceives. So this matters. What do the experts say? Who are the experts? Are you guys the experts? Yes, you are. Uh, to most of the world, you guys are, are sort of weird experts. <laughs> As soon as you say you're at Georgia Tech, people think that you're kind of a weird expert. Uh, but this becomes an interesting question, not only politically, but legally, because who is, who is qualified to um, provide information as an expert? Uh, the courts have had to worry about this in a variety of, of guises. You know, uh, how does a judge admit testimony from somebody that says, oh, I'm a scientific expert, and I'm, what I'm presenting in the courtroom, or in the case of an agency, is what science knows about nanotechnology. Well, who says science knows that? What does that mean? What if, um, I mean, I'm just wondering how many disciplines are represented in this room. Physics, chemistry, chemical engineering, biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, what else? Did I miss anybody? Material science, yeah. So as a material scientist, qualified to act as an expert on something that involves the biological effects of exposure to a particular nanoscale phenomenon. Well, you might have a PhD in material science or chemistry. Does that make you an expert on, on, on biology? Right? And this is a profound question that agencies have to, to deal with. And we did a big study for the Department of Energy a number of years ago looking at how 
scientists with PhDs in science or engineering currently working in research capacities, how they perceive risks. And it turns out that uh, there is enormous variance in how scientists and engineers from different fields, uh, working in different sectors of the economy, even to some degree by gender, how they perceive risk. So it matters which experts you ask sometimes. I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. What will Congress say? What will the court say? What will the president say? If EPA says we're going to do this, who's going to, to challenge them or question them? Ultimately, they also confront this question. And it's something, again, that agencies don't like to talk about, where they have to acknowledge this thing about what is the right thing to do. There are always questions at some point where you say, well, the law does, isn't clear. We don't have clear guidance. What is the right thing to do? So ultimately, that appears. So real quickly, I'm just going to go through a couple of things. This was the rule that EPA issued as a result of this new law. Um, and I know you can't see it from back, from even, probably even the front row. But basically, this is uh, the Federal Register, or something that comes out every single day. It's where all agencies say, here's what we're doing. So that everybody can see that agency, it's, the CIA doesn't do it, not every agency. Uh, but basically, all the regulatory agencies are required to do this. And so a couple of years ago, um, in 2015, they started, they issued what was called a proposed rule. And they said, here's what we're thinking about doing. Now, two years later, they're issuing a proposed rule. And what happens in that period is, I'm going to do that very quickly. But this is basically, basically saying, here's what this rule is about. Now, EPA is uh, requiring persons that manufacture or process or intend to manufacture, blah, blah, blah. And it mentions that it includes certain nanoscale materials and how this stuff has to be reported. Here's how to get involved. Here's how, how you guys can know what's going on. They provide the information. Here's the, you can go online and look at all the information the EPA has been using. Here's the office, the room number. There's the phone number. For more information, here's Jim Allwood at EPA. He's the guy who's in charge of doing all this stuff. Here is his phone number, his email address. If you have any questions, concerns, or objections, he's your guy. There's no secret. You know, every person in this room could leave here and five minutes later be on the phone trying to talk to Mr. Allwood. Maybe he'll return your call. Uh, but the process is amazingly open. Most people don't realize this. In some ways, the regulatory process is the most democratic, small d democratic process we have in the United States because it is this open and permeable. A bit more on that. Here are some guidelines they provide on how to comment. Okay, so EPA issues a proposed rule and they say, anybody, if you don't like this or if you've got contrary evidence, you can comment. Here's how to comment. They even give you guidelines, to, reminding you things like, oh, please read and understand the document that you're commenting on. That would be good. Explain your views clearly, avoiding the use of profanity or personal threats. <laughs> Suggest alternatives and substitute language for your requested changes. Base your comments on sound reasoning, scientific evidence, and so forth. Describe any assumptions you're making. If you're, if you're estimating costs and benefits, please explain how you arrived at this estimate in sufficient detail to allow for it to be reproduced or checked and so forth. So every one of you can comment. Um, the agency goes on to talk about the actions that it's taking. <clears throat> this will all be in the slide deck, which I guess will be available to you. Uh, here's the point I wanted to make. Uh, for this proposed rule, there were 86 comments that were filed. And here's a partial list of them. And you can't see those even on the front row. But some of them are, for example, um, the Titanium Dioxide Stewardship Council, the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers, the Nano Manufacturing Association, the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association, Executive Director of the Nanotechnology Coalition, somebody from the Department of Ecology, the State of Washington, the Enzyme Technical Association, Semiconductor Industry Association, and so forth. There's one thing in here called anonymous public comment. Um, I didn't look at the numbers for this one, but a recent study of the FDA found that about 85% of comments that are filed are filed by industry or industry groups. You know, it's not uh, environmental groups or consumer groups or individuals. Um, most of the comments are filed by, by industry. And these are people that can say, there is this detail here in what you're proposing that just doesn't make sense. And they know, they know how to communicate effectively with these agencies. So here's an example. This is what, well, my screen up here disappeared. Um, 
Comment five, what EPA does, what agencies do is they group together the comments and they say there were a whole bunch of comments that dealt with this question. Uh, many commenters stated the proposal gives too much discretion to interpret compliance obligations. They suggested clarifying the definition of unique and novel properties and so forth. Response, based on these comments, EPA agrees that what is a reportable chemical substance should be better defined and clarified. EPA is finaling this rule with further explanation of what we mean by this. And you can go through all of the, the docket and you can see times where EPA said, yeah, okay, that comment makes sense. We, we could have done a better job here. We've adjusted things. Try intervening with your member of Congress <laughs> to get a piece of legislation adjusted based on your input or the input from your company or, or trade association. So uh, the process can work pretty darn well. It's also pretty darn slow. Um, I'll try to finish up quickly. Uh, how fast does this go? Uh, 2008, EPA started looking into these things. That, that was under the Bush administration. Then Obama came in September 2009. EPA said, yeah, we're going to review that approach and see whether we can include nanomaterials in the same thing that um, the Bush administration was saying that we're not really going to pay attention to. Uh, 2015, EPA said it was formally developing a rule. 2014, they said they're developing a new proposal. 2015, EPA issues the proposed rule. 2016, Congress passes this new law. 2017, Congre uh, EPA, in January, EPA issues this final rule, the one I was just showing you. And June of 2017, EPA announced how it's going to try to implement some of these things. And uh, last month, the EPA, in its uh, fiscal year 2019 budget, announced that it's going to be conducting research on a number of topics. And basically, no one knows how the current administration is going to, and the current EPA is going to be dealing with what the Obama EPA had come up with. I mean, they're going to be constrained to some degree by law, but how, how quickly they go in implementing things and how they're going to implement it is still to be, still to be seen. All right, so uh, I'm just going to mention this one very quickly. Um, there are a lot of agencies that are involved. I've mentioned EPA and FDA, but these are all of the federal departments and agencies that participate in the National Nanotechnology Initiative. Um, okay, everybody got that list memorized? Good. Uh, <laughs> And there are some of them here that have asterisks, which, which you can't see very well. Uh, and those are the ones that actually have a budget dedicated to nanotechnology research and development. Uh, this is, these are the dollar amounts. Again, this will be in the slide deck um, if, if you can get these. Um, with all of those agencies working in this area, there's got to be some kind of coordination. And this is the national, uh, this is the Nanoscale Science Engineering and Technology Subcommittee. Um, who's up here? Let's see, we've got Office of Science and Technology Policy, Office of Management and Budget, Consumer Product Safety Commission, Department of Commerce, just going down the left. And that includes the Patent and Trademark Office and so forth. Department of Defense, Department of Education, Energy, Health and Human Services, Homeland Security, Interior, and so forth. Basically, the entire federal government uh, is involved in some way. And there, here are the names of the people. Um, I don't know Danielle Jones, but uh, Jim Kim and Emily Mock at OMB, those are the people that work on the nano stuff for, for OMB, which is part of the Executive Office of the President. Um, one of them has a PhD from Johns Hopkins in something technical, I can't remember. Uh, also has a master's in bioethics from Penn. Um, that's James Kim. Emily Mock has a, I can't remember, her undergraduate degrees were in something in science and engineering. She has a law degree from Oxford. These are not amateurs. These are very serious people with, you know, they're both in their early 30s, but still these are, these are, these are sharp people. So, you know, don't think about faceless bureaucrats that don't know anything that are trying to influence these policies. Um, Congress, uh, with fine print up there on the top right, a sample of the number of congressional committees and subcommittees that have held hearings on nanotechnology over a number of years, and they're, they're more than that. One of them is the Subcommittee on European Affairs. Well, it's because there is this question about trying to harmonize whatever we do in the United States in the regulatory realm with what the Europeans are doing on regulating. And the Europeans are a little bit ahead of us in some ways. Uh, there was a, na a Congressional Nanotechnology Caucus. This was a big enough issue that a number of members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, um, got together occasionally and said, this is a big issue for our state or for our district, and we're going to work together to try to make good policy. Um, the, this caucus disappeared in 2011. It's kind of curious about why, I couldn't find a reason. And I think this might be the reason. 
this is funding for nanotechnology by fiscal year. And you can see around 2010 and 2011, there's a peak and then the funding starts to drop off. When, when funding starts to drop off, so does congressional interest. So um, that might be why this caucus disappeared. But from time to time, Congress actually gets pretty energized and, and involved. Uh, in the legal realm, um, not very much has happened yet. As the beginning of next year, uh, last year, <clears throat> there had been no reported American case where um, damages have been awarded to a person claiming to be injured by nanoparticles, but that's, that still leaves the door open for a number of things. And this will be interesting to follow over the years. Final question is, how do we get it right? All right, this is what a lot of you may be wondering. Okay, the, this is all really complicated, a lot of legal, political stuff. How do we just get it right? First of all, trying to f figure out what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Uh, how are these uncertainties that we've talked about, how are they going to be resolved? Which institutions are going to be involved and so forth? Uh, what's the time horizon for the problem? It's the thing I've been working on. And ultimately, what's the objective? Well, we want to have as much good stuff from nanotechnology as possible while minimizing the risk. Seems, seems reasonable. Um, that's a pretty broad objective. So what is it that we actually expect to happen? Well, um, sorry, here's what I would expect to happen. First of all, there's going to be continuing incremental regulatory change, sort of what we've been seeing. Um, there, we should see some greater coordination between agencies and between agencies in industry. Uh, things have gotten fairly comfortable. Some people think they've gotten too comfortable. Some kind of meta-regulation, what the European Union did was they set out a code of conduct, which basically said up here at this 30,000 foot level, we're going to set up uh, some general principles and then industry and agencies across the EU can try to comply with those general um, principles. Soft regulation such as voluntary data reporting, so forth, public dialogue. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of stuff that says that the areas of synthetic biology, bioengineering, medicine, and cosmetics are going to get more attention over the next few years um, than things like nanomachines, environmental issues, and, and military uses. So any of you doing stuff with the bio realm, uh, you'll be watched. And maybe there will be a prey type event, some kind of a release, some kind of accident, somebody claiming that something happened to them. So here are two visions of the future. On the left, we've got how nanotechnology could re-engineer us, right? And there are all sorts of examples here. This is you know, out there in the public uh, with all kinds of examples of ways that she's being fixed, her bones, her tissues, her organs, every all kinds of things by nanotechnology. On the right is a fairly unfortunate looking, I think it's a guy, um, and these are the diseases associated with nanoparticle exposure and all kinds of horrific things. Um, so we've got two visions of the world here, two visions of the future. And what's going to happen? I'll just leave it this way. Um, you're at Georgia Tech. Our s current slogan is creating the next. I can't think of a better group of people to put the challenge to, okay? You're at Georgia Tech and you're in the business of creating the next. So it's largely up to you. Okay, um, if you have any questions, I don't know if, I hope we have some time for that. I should add there are a number of people in my school uh, that have a strong interest in, uh, some of us have been doing work with folks at the, uh, at the Nanotechnology Center at Arizona State, some at Santa Barbara, but more Arizona State. Uh, so uh, if any of you want to pursue any of these questions further uh, with people outside the uh, science and engineering realm, there are a number of us, you can contact me and I'll put you, if, if it's not me, I'll put you in touch with somebody who's an appropriate person to, to work with. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the language that's often used is that the Europeans are, are, are more open about adopting what's called the precautionary principle. Uh, and the precautionary principle, it's controversial in this country and other places. But basically the question is, uh, where does the burden of proof lie? Does it lie with the producers of the technology to prove that something's safe, or does it lie with, say, environmental groups and government regulators to show that something is dangerous? So. Uh, the Europeans have proclaimed, in fact, even the conservative government of the United Kingdom a few years ago said that, of course, we adopt the precautionary principle, which seems a lot more restrictive. 
you put the, put the burden of proof on the producers of the technology, the manufacturers, to say, you've got to show to us that this stuff is safe before you can do it. Uh, so uh, a lot of people would say that for that reason, the Europeans are ahead. Uh, but they've also been um, slow, reluctant, um, to get very specific about what is and what isn't allowed. The regulatory history of the United States is filled with examples of regulatory agencies slowing things down because the technology is changing so quickly that whatever you say in June, somebody at Georgia Tech is going to come up with something in October that's going to make that standard obsolete. So you have to sort of let the technology ripen and mature before you can set specific standards, and that's kind of what the Europeans have been doing too. Their pronouncements have been a bit broader and more ambitious, but I'm not sure that they're, uh, the details are, are, are that different. And it, it, harmonization is a really big issue because no one, you know, a lot of companies have a really strong stake in making sure that whatever the Germans, the French, and the British say, that the same rules would apply to uh, research and production in the United States. So there, we're sort of, it's a, it's a delicate dance between those realms. Sure.